I volunteered to sit next to a dead man on a plane and deeply regret it. The man in seat 43 had died halfway across the Atlantic. I was sitting near the front of the plane, just behind first class, and couldn't really see the commotion. But I could hear someone gasping and retching, loud at first, then quieter and quieter. A flight attendant got on the pod and asked for any medical professionals among the passengers to help. I guess there were none. After a few minutes, the man's sounds deteriorated into a sort of gurgle, then silence, then it was over. His name was Molyneux, and he was old but not that old, and it was likely a heart attack, aneurysm, drug reaction or God's will, according to conflicting NTH hand reports that filtered down the plane from row 43, where a flight attendant simply buckled the newly deceased back into his window seat and covered his face with a complimentary airline blanket. The pilot got on the intercom and told us the plane would be turning back to New York due to a tragic medical situation involving one of our passengers. Folks, we're looking for a volunteer willing to sit next to the deceased while we return to our originating airport, the pilot continued. This flight is entirely full, and the person sitting there now isn't feeling comfortable. It's an aisle seat, and it will only be a few hours before we're back over land. I'm not sure why I volunteered, probably some combination of exhaustion, altruism and morbid curiosity. My vacation plans were shot anyway, I figured, so why not take the most interesting seat on the plane? The flight attendant thanked me profusely, as did a queasy-looking teenager who took my original seat. I picked up my handbag and shuffled down the aisle to the very last row of the plane. My only prior experience with corpses was an open casket funeral for my grandmother when I was a kid, but the idea of death had never particularly bothered me. It's natural, after all. That said, I admit that I second-guessed my decision as soon as I saw my new seatmate. Mr. Molyneux, rest in peace, sat upright between the window and me, strapped around the waist, with a blue fleece blanket covering his torso and head. The blanket did not cover his hands, which were resting on his lap above his seatbelt, placed that way by a flight attendant as a sign of respect, I assumed. Molyneux's pale fingers were twisted into claws that betrayed the agony of his death. I couldn't look at those hands without imagining what his face looked like under the blanket. I thought of asking for a second blanket, but the flight crew was still busy calming down other passengers and preparing for our U-turn around the Atlantic Ocean. So I tried to forget my uneasiness and closed my eyes and slept. I woke, hours or minutes later, I don't know, to the jostling of turbulence. The cabin lights were off and most of the passengers around me seemed to be sleeping. I looked out the window, trying not to look at Molyneux as I did so, and saw only the uniform blackness of the night. I imagined the ocean miles below us, lightless and cold. The thought unsettled me and I reached across Molyneux to close the window shade. Then I stopped myself. Hadn't the shade been closed when I sat down? I realized there was something else off about the scene. Molyneux's posture had somehow changed while I slept. It took me a few seconds to pinpoint it. His gnarled hands remained on his lap, he was still belted at the waist, and the blanket still shrouded his upper body. But the fabric looked somehow twisted now, as if he had been fidgeting. Very slowly, knowing it was insane even as I knew I couldn't stop myself, I lifted a corner of the blanket. I uncovered his shirt, which the flight crew had unbuttoned while trying to save him. A patch of blue-gray skin sprouting white chest hair peeked out from it. I lifted the blanket higher. His collar was flecked with dried blood. I remembered his terrible gasping. Finally, I pulled the blanket entirely off and stifled a scream. Molyneux's head was turned away from me, exactly as if he had turned to stare out the window. I could see his face reflected in the plexiglass. It was undoubtedly a dead man's face, pale, drawn, lips parted, jaw slack. There was no life in it, except his eyes. They were moving. I stared at the reflection for half a minute and I'm sure of it. In the center of that death mask, two pupils flicked back and forth, as if tracking something out there in the sky. What are you doing? A voice beside me interrupted. I whipped around and saw the woman seated across the aisle staring at me, not so much in fear as disgust. Cover him back up. Give him his peace. Please. I think he's been moving, I stammered. His eyes. I think he might not actually be. But I couldn't finish the sentence, it was too crazy. Nor did I have to, because at that moment my stomach dropped ten feet along with everything else in the plane. Coffee cups and purses slammed against the ceiling. A man near the first class section nearly tumbled out of his seat. I heard call lights going off all over the plane as passengers were jolted awake in panic and confusion. Passengers, please take your seats, buckle in, and secure any loose items, the pilot said over the paw, sounding shaken himself. The weather along our flight path is clear and no planes in the area are reporting turbulence, so I'm not sure what this is. But we should be through it momentarily. Even as he spoke, the mild background shaking I'd felt since waking up became noticeably more violent. The woman across the aisle began fumbling for her seatbelt, no longer paying any attention to me or Molyneux. I forced myself to look at him again. The jolt must have caused him to pitch forward at the waist, his head colliding with the seat in front of him. But Molyneux's face was still turned toward the window, his neck twisted at such a sharp angle that I worried it had snapped. I looked at his hands again, and the pallor of his skin. Three flight attendants and a dozen passengers had witnessed this man's death, and I could not rationally imagine they were mistaken. And yet in the reflection of the window, his eyes left to right, left to right. I had heard that strange reflexes sometimes kick in after death, limbs flailing, headless chickens running, nerves clearing out the last backlog of instructions from the brain. But the eyes, I had never heard of that. I made myself look past that unsettling reflection at the sky itself. It was still dark, moonless and cloudless, but the atmosphere seemed to have taken on a strange hue, a very dark green, like pea soup fog. I thought I could see vague shapes swirling around in the murk, though it might have been an optical illusion. I recoiled. I desperately wanted to be anywhere else right then, but the rest of the cabin was approaching a state of pandemonium. 
Flight attendants were hurrying up and down the aisles, attending to spills and bruises, even as they tripped and staggered. The entire plane was shuddering like a barrel going down the rapids. A series of jolts sent Molyneux's upper body swinging back and forth like an upside-down pendulum. He was thrown backward into his seat, then sideways into me, and then the opposite way, his face slamming directly into the window, where it came to rest. That was enough for me. I unbuckled, leapt out of my seat and locked myself in the bathroom directly behind me. I would cower on a toilet for the rest of this hellish flight rather than spend another minute sitting with Mr. Molyneux. This plan worked for a half hour or so. I braced both my arms against the bathroom's walls and listened to the chimes of flight attendant call buttons, the whine of jet engines and the growling of the sky. I tried to calm myself by visualizing the skyline of New York, the JFK airstrip, a calm descent. But then I imagined Molyneux's window, his face mashed up against the glass like a little boy's, his dead eyes searching the night. The captain's disembodied voice called me back to reality. He sounded outright scared now, and the paw kept cutting in and out. Extremely anomalous weather. Lead everyone in their seats in the emergency position. Immediately, if we depressurize, the turbulence stopped for four or five seconds, and then suddenly it felt like I was inside a washing machine. I bounced against the walls of the bathroom, landed on the floor, and could barely manage to get the door open and crawl on all fours into the aisle. All three flight attendants were down, sprawled on backs and bellies between the seats. Some of the overhead luggage bins had burst open and spewed baggage out. Many of the passengers were weeping. A few prayed. And through it all, the plane would not stop shaking. I heard a series of small bangs above my head and felt something wet on my cheek. Every single soda can in the galley had exploded. I climbed into my seat and belted myself in, having briefly forgotten about Molyneux in my terror. Thwack thwack. But he was still in his seat of course, whipping back and forth like a flagpole in a hurricane, head butting the window so hard that I could see the plexiglass balloon outwards and rebound each time. Thwack. I became worried he'd crack the window, though that's supposed to be impossible, so I overcame my revulsion and grabbed his shoulders. But I couldn't restrain him. Again and again, his head hit the window. I began to fear that it was not simply the motion of the plane that compelled him. Thwack thwack thwack. No one else on the plane was watching this. Some of the passengers had rallied and were trying to pull the injured flight attendants out of the aisle. Others were whispering goodbye messages into their phones. Thwack thwack krkrrrr. -R 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 -R. I heard something crack beside me, and hoped desperately that it was Molyneux's skull, and not the window. Outside I could see that the green fog was alive with swirling, amorphous shapes. Thwack krkrrrr krkum krkum. Another explosion. Not pop cans this time, but pressurized oxygen escaping into sky. Molyneux had managed to smash out both window panes in one final blow. Now his mangled head was hanging outside the plane, and the rest of his body was straining to follow it, restrained only by his seatbelt and the width of his shoulders. An alarm went off in the cabin, and a jungle of oxygen masks fell from the ceilings. I put mine on at once, but heard other people screaming. Some passengers were trying desperately to get masks on the unconscious air crew, but the plane was shaking more violently than ever, and loose debris was flying up the aisles toward my row, toward the hole a dead man had made in the airplane. Cabin breach, said the pilot. Limited backup oxygen, so I'm trying to descend to a safe altitude. But hard to do that in this storm, or whatever it is. God be with us. Once I was sure that I could breathe and was no in danger of being sucked out myself, I took one last look at Molyneux. His head might have torn clean off outside the window, for all I could see of it past the rest of his body. I pictured those eyes again, which had seen something in the sky that we had not seen, could not see, even as it now threatened to shake the plane apart. There was some connection between these events that I might never understand. But even without understanding, I could make the last move available to me. I reached over Molyneux's lap, lifted one of those cold, clawed hands, and unclasped his seatbelt. There was an intolerable crunching noise as, I presume, his shoulders were squeezed and crushed to fit the window frame. And then in a split second he was gone, out the window, into the night, a pale old man falling end over end toward the black ocean. Whatever you saw out there, I whispered. Whatever you were looking for, go to it and leave us be. The green fog lifted a few minutes later, and the plane descended until it was safe to breathe without the masks. Less than an hour later, I really did see the JFK airstrip. A whole squadron of police and ambulances met us on the way down. The flight attendants and several passengers had to be hospitalized, but as far as I know no one suffered serious injuries. Federal investigators eventually concluded that we had flown through a localized weather anomaly, witnessed by no other plane in the sky that night. Some sort of debris must have been flying around up there with us and taken out the window at 43A, they wrote in their report. This event led to a sudden loss of cabin pressure, in which the body of a passenger who had died earlier in an unrelated medical emergency was ejected from the plane. I expected to hear a lot more about it on the news, but I suppose in the end it was just one of those things. The airline had no interest in publicizing the incident, of course, and the passengers had no desire to relive it. For most people on the flight, it was simply a freak tragedy followed by a close call, and all's well that ends well. I'm the only one that will dream for the rest of my life about Molyneux's eyes, and what they saw on the way to the ocean.